and welcome to this episode of Every Current. I'm your host, Bill Florence, and I'm excited about today's topic, wind energy. I'm joined today by two subject matter experts in this area, Brandon Fitchett and Curtis Fox, who are both members of EPRI's Power Generation Sector R&D and Renewables. Thank you so much for joining us today, guys. I appreciate it. So, Brandon, can you give us maybe like a 50,000-foot overview of wind energy and and what's going on with uh, that today? Sure, Bill. Thanks a lot, and thanks for having me here on the EPRI Current Podcast. It's an honor to be here in the the, uh, the studio today. Um, I've been an engineer about 20 years and focused on wind energy for the vast majority of that time now so far. Um, in, in, in the last 15 years, I've watched wind energy grow by about 10 times across the globe uh, from the tens and, and almost 100 gigawatt scale to now nearly one terawatt. That's uh, about 1,000 gigawatts of wind energy across the globe. That milestone will be surpassed here certainly over the next year or so. It's grown similarly in the U.S. as it has across the globe. Wind energy isn't new. Um, It's been around thousands of years actually, but from a utility scale standpoint, that's what we're going to be talking about here uh, from utility scale electricity generation and and, uh, the the power generated by wind energy. The energy produced um, has gone from somewhere around one to, to a few percent of, of our electricity up to nearly 10, 10% of our electricity now across the globe and across the U.S. comes from the electricity generated by wind turbines. Now, is that including both onshore wind turbines and offshore wind turbines? That is inclusive of onshore and offshore. I would say offshore is fairly early in that stage of deployment, but it is starting to deploy rapidly, and you're hearing a lot about it in the news. Curtis Fox is our offshore wind R&D uh, expert here at EPRI, and he has been around offshore longer than just about anybody. So I'd hand that question to Curtis to, to handle a little more in depth. Thank you, Brandon and Bill. It's great to be on the podcast here with you guys today. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, expansion in offshore wind. Uh, It's primarily started out of Europe a decade or so ago, um, but it's really grown to be an international affair. Uh, We're seeing a lot of projects and firsts happening here in the U.S. market, Um, but we've got the the Asian markets, China, uh, Taiwan are are really hot. Vietnam has had a great year as well this past uh, 2021. Um, So we saw a lot of growth in the industry. Um, not nearly the, the, the capacity yet that we've seen in, in onshore wind. Uh, and most of that's due to maturity of the technology, uh, supply chain constraints, and, and really uh, target markets being developed. So we're seeing a lot of developers throughout the world uh, looking to deploy offshore wind where, where it has an advantage. So we're seeing, I mean, there are unique challenges and opportunities with both offshore and uh, onshore um, wind energy. Is that correct? I mean, can you talk, go into a little more detail, maybe maybe first about what some of the, the, the those challenges and opportunities are with uh, the marine-based uh, technology? It's a good question, Bill. So there's a number of unique places where offshore wind will make sense. Um, and this has to do where you have large load centers or, or dense populations uh, relatively close to the coast. Uh, and they also have land constrained areas where they're unable to deploy solar or traditional onshore wind assets to meet their renewable energy portfolio targets. So you're seeing states lend to, to going offshore and, and procuring, um, looking to procure uh, energy from offshore wind assets. And so there's a number of things that are, that are in play there. You have the offshore wind permitting issues where you traverse state and federal waters. Uh, You have environmental impacts to be concerned with. You have dual use with fisheries. Uh, You have marine mammals. You also have uh, birds and bat interactions in the offshore environment, uh, as well as corrosive materials uh, or corrosive environment with a salt spray on, on, you know, steel materials and composite materials that make up the wind farm. 
So you have a number of just natural challenges that are different than the onshore space, and they require uh, a unique set of, of technologies to, to overcome. And so as this you know, offshore wind matures as an industry, we're tackling and, and overcoming those challenges as, as, as we can. Now, Brandon, I mean, uh, Curtis makes it sound like, like all the challenges are with offshore wind energy, but there, there must also be you know, unique challenges when it comes to onshore uh, wind energy as well. Would that be correct? Uh, absolutely, Bill. Yeah, and and unique challenges onshore, unique challenges offshore. You know, starting out, the industry was challenged with just the, the pure economics. Wind energy was expensive. Um, offshore is starting to get into some of that now, driving down costs drastically every year. Uh, onshore is a little bit more mature in that sense, where the costs have been driven down dramatically uh, to the point where projected costs for the energy produced per kilowatt hour is on the order of three to five cents, depending on where this onshore wind facility is placed. That starts to, all, all the, the costs drivers, the, the economic drivers were, were definitely big challenges. Um, that has driven wind turbine designs to be specifically designed for different locations. Transmission constraints are still a big issue um, across the US. Land constraints are a big issue in certain locations, especially in Europe um, and, and in Asia as well. That has actually started to drive some of the wind energy offshore, that land constraint. Uh, it has also driven larger and larger turbines, larger and larger power ratings. Um, the transmission constraint markets have driven larger and larger rotor sizes on the same size of wind turbines to drive up capacity factors. And all of these changes and technology evolutions have started to uh, catch up in terms of reliability. You know, every step up in, in this technology, which has happened every couple of years, um, has come along with reliability challenges. So the, the economics, the costs have still come down, um, but now some of the, the focus is starting to move towards what are, how can we build uh, more industrialized and more reliable, more mass produced types of large components to make sure that these things operate reliably um, and resiliently. And I know on the, the environmental aspects, um, Curtis mentioned some of the things in the water and, and offshore. Onshore, there is a lot of concern about bats. Um, there are some endangered species of bats, which uh, have been impacted in the wild uh, by certain diseases but also can get impacted by wind turbines. So uh, here at EPRI, we're working on, uh, with our environmental uh, folks on optimizing energy output of these power plants. At the same time, uh, we can find new modes of operation and may reduce power output slightly, but to protect um, some, some certain species of wildlife. There are some also generic challenges around recycling um, Curtis mentioned some of the composite components. Those are the challenge. Uh, nearly everything else is made of some type of metal, which has a market for recycling and will be recycled at the end of its use. But the composites blades are a challenge, uh, which there are numerous as well, uh, technologies and, and research paths that EPRI is looking into to, to try to solve. Now, I think we may have to do a follow-up episode on just on the sort of the environmental uh, impacts and, and um, challenges, particularly from dealing with uh, endangered species. Uh, but um, but you did touch upon the reliability component. I mean, the wind turbines are what the largest rotating structures in the world. I mean, there's a lot going on there. It's more than just like a, a simple child's pinwheel, you know, it's just blowing in the wind. I mean, there's a lot that's going on there, um, you know, mechanically. So uh, the questions I had were, again, so, I mean, what are looking at... Um, uh, the issues maybe with reliability. And then too, I'm just kind of, you also talked about the recycling aspects. Is there a, like a lifespan on blades and some of the other components where they have to be uh, replaced on or maybe or service on a regular basis? And maybe Curtis, maybe let me talk about uh, the offshore uh, angle on this first. Yes. Thank you, Bill. The, there are a number of unique challenges in the, in the reliability aspects. And if we look at, at the onshore space first and we say, Onshore turbines here in the U.S. traditionally stalled at about the two to three megawatt 
range. And that was due to, due to logistics, right? Getting them around the country, uh, maneuvering the blades down roads and those elements. Um, and, and so it, it typically stalled there. And in Europe, where they're, they're more land constrained, they, they look for larger turbines. You know, they went up from the three megawatt on up into the five and six megawatt onshore units. And offshore, over the past decade, we have seen just an explosion. So when we talk about a lot of the you know, units that have been installed to date, most of these are three megawatt to five megawatt units. We talk about new capacity that we're adding in and developing today. You're talking about 12, 14, 15 megawatt units with you know potential for 18 megawatt units out into uh into the 2030 time frame you mentioned it and you hit it right these are the largest rotating structures in the world so when we look at the loads that are in place and the loads that are imparted upon the bearings and all those rotating components the flexibility uh, of the system and and how much the structure moves when it is loaded by the wind there's a lot of challenges associated with that. And just the sheer scale of these units, I mean, they would dwarf almost any skyline. I mean, they would be prominent aspects uh, in, in any skyline around the U.S. Um, and so when we look at blades, there's a lot of challenges in there. You ask what time frame and how long. Uh, the design standards would say you need a minimum design life of 20 years. Uh, in the offshore space, we're seeing that trying to be pushed to 25 to 30 years um, due just to the, you know, the significant capital uh, expenditures required for offshore wind with the foundations and all of that. Um, but going back to blades, these are huge structures. They're over 100 meters long, uh, composite uh, fiber uh, reinforced structures. And you see a lot of challenges with them associated with just being exposed to the weather. Whether it's onshore or offshore, you have leading edge erosion challenges that can limit the life of your blade. You can repair those elements, um, but they just add cost to the asset. And so traditionally, the industry has not looked at blades particularly as an asset, um, but as the industry does mature onshore and offshore, you're starting to see owners and operators really look and track the blades themselves as an asset, much like they would the generator and the foundation, trying to get the longevity that they can out of them and really reduce the operating expenses uh, over the lifetime of these assets. Brandon, anything to add to that? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, with, with some of these challenges, I would also say brings some opportunities that the industry has not yet grasped as the industry's mostly been driven um, by you know, revenue-based power plants and power plants that are, that are driven in some cases in the US by tax credits and that there, there is a 10-year tax credit in place for new assets, for new wind energy assets in the US. Onshore, most of the time, that will be a production-based tax credit. Um, offshore, it is typically now an investment-based tax credit. Uh, so for that that onshore production-based tax credit, it lasts for 10 years, and that brings in a lot of investments, a lot of financial backing, uh, a lot of uh, uh, purely financial plays to harvest that tax credit from wind energy. And after that 10 years, there's a, some ownership structure changes. Really, all the the the, the revenue is is generated in that first 10 years that some of those investors care about. Now, where, where we have wind energy changing, renewables changing overall, is that it's becoming a more integral part of the power system. It's not only about revenue anymore. It is about energy generation. It is about now starting to be, uh, now, now starting to be more about reliable and resilient and cost-effective and sustainable energy generation, which is why we're talking about all of these things. So part of the challenge there and part of this opportunity with these very large structures in the seabed with foundations onshore, large, large concrete foundations onshore, large steel structures in the seabed offshore, transmission lines running from power plants to shore offshore, uh, as well as um, you know, substations, large scale now, as these plants are getting larger and larger scale, these are hundreds of megawatts um, of power plant and, and transmission and distribution equipment that is usually designed 
for 30 to 50 years, um, and some of it longer, you know, in, in terms of other parts of the power industry, utilities are having this perspective that their power plants are, you know, 30 to 50 year assets and not this 10 year revenue generator or 10 year tax credit generator. So that's really flipping this perspective and vision of what these plants need to be from a, you know, 10 to 20 year to 25 year type of asset to maybe a 30 to 50 year and beyond type of asset. And some of these challenges as well will always be there. And some of these challenges are actually increasing the, the um, visible uh, impact and, and some of the environmental impacts and permitting. Once you have these assets in place, it's starting to become apparent that the asset may be there for longer than the 20 to 25 year design life of an individual wind turbine. So that's a, a huge opportunity as we see to start designing these plants to be longer term uh, power plants. I'm now gonna ask both of you like to take out your crystal balls and to gaze into them and give us some idea of what's coming up next. What, what should we be looking to um, uh, happening here in the future with wind energy? What are some of the, um, again, going back to challenges and opportunities, but what's next? What's next on the horizon for wind energy? So that's a great question, Bill. There's, you know, we're seeing a lot of news and activity around offshore wind as we're spooling up our first initial projects here in the U.S. Uh, we're seeing, you know, substations go in. We're seeing um, new projects be released. We're seeing auctions happening. The New York Bite auction fetched a world record for for seabed leasing. Uh, we're seeing changes in, in, in the supply chain. We're seeing new factories being built. We're seeing a lot of things go on as we spool up this whole industry here in the U.S. But there's some other things we need to think about as we move forward. And there's a number of people in the industry looking at this. And it's building out your assets in a way that you don't just strand each individual, individual offshore wind farm. So if you ask me what I think the next big push is, it's going to be meshed offshore transmission. Uh, and the reason for that is, and the analogy is, you could say you have all these cables for your computers, all these things that need power plugs. And if you ran them all over to the wall, that would be great. But you have a whole bunch of wires running over to the wall. Well, what if you extended that out with a power strip and you got it to where you need it, right? And you plug them all in nice and neatly into the power strip. Well, that's what we're trying to do, but the, the, the present tax incentives and the present development strategy of offshore wind, particularly here in the U.S., lends itself to one wind farm with one or multiple cables back to shore, and we quickly run out of plugs in that wall, right? So we need, we need terminal strips. So what we need to focus on is developing strategies where we leverage offshore transmission in both just a you know reliability sense for if my wind farms cable goes out at least i can export some power uh, on my neighbor's cable as well uh, but also in terms of interregional transmission if we look at the northeast you know new england new jersey new york right you have a real opportunity to overcome some transmission barriers and reduce the cost to those ratepayers by adding in basically an in the ocean expressway for energy Right, and be able to balance the, the energy costs between those regions. So in the offshore space, we're seeing a lot of activity focused on this uh, meshed networks, be it HVAC or HVDC. You've seen the first solicitations from New York and New Jersey in their latest rounds requiring uh, meshing in the offshore network. Uh, that's from a reliability stance, but I think as we move forward, you'll see more of high capacity transmission in that space. So. Stay tuned on that. We'll see a lot more coming up in, in, in interregional transmission and offshore wind transmission. I have a, I'll, I'll take a couple things to add to that, Bill, as well. I mean, well put, Curtis, for sure, especially in the offshore space. There's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, if we have a string of sites up and down a coastline to string those sites together and create a transmission corridor. Um, Numerous, numerous aspects, I'd say, in kind of just the, the basic plant uh, design, the basic vision of what these power plants are is, is changing and, and is being more accepted as, you know, bulk, bulk power plants. Uh, in that regard, they're going to need to be more resilient 
I mentioned earlier the drive for economics and the drive down cost of energy. It, it has been, I'd say, successful. Um, but part of that has, has been uh, tough decisions and, and some sacrifice in terms of resilience of these assets. You know, they are designed to produce the lowest cost energy possible right now, and they're, they're doing that. Um, but, you know, that, that may not meet the needs of the future power grid where wind energy now 10%, maybe it becomes 20 or 30% of the electricity produced on a power grid. It can't just go away if it gets too cold outside or too hot outside. Uh, but those have been decisions made um, that, you know, these assets, they do have um, ambient temperature limits to make sure we can keep the costs down. They may shut down if it gets too hot or cold outside. And those are those were decisions made to make more economic assets. So those things will probably start to change. There will be more demands placed on these assets, um, as well as the, the longer term perspective uh, that I mentioned of assets starting to be designed for the longer term. That may actually improve economics if you can reuse things like foundations and uh, substations and balance of plant. Another key to that reuse is industrialization. So a plateauing of the size growth of wind turbines, both onshore and offshore. We have had, um, you know, executives from some of the largest wind energy companies out there say, saying that they are going to pause the growth of the size of their offshore wind turbines. I think that was a pretty major happening that will start to happen across the board, but it will enable this industrialization, this mass production and lessons learned from the field to be able to, to feed back into new designs and new production of the same components, but improved, the same but improved components. So some mass production, some lessons learned from the field, making it into an industrialization process. And that has yet to happen at all in wind energy. So there's a huge opportunity. there, And there's a huge opportunity in risk reduction as well there. Um, across the industry, we've seen, you know, a number of suppliers struggle with kind of infant mortality challenges and reliability challenges that if we're able to deploy in an industrialized aspect, we'll be able to overcome. Uh, and the great turbine race or arms race, as some people have referred to it, right, impacts the whole supply chain, right? You're talking about cranes for onshore, you're talking about vessels for offshore, um, you know, bolting techniques and capabilities all the way to generators and, and, and thermal capacity within cabling, right? I mean, there's all sorts of challenges that keep going up and up and up in size that you don't ever get to overcome uh, and, and really engineer out of the final solution. Thank you so much, Brandon and Curtis, for sharing your expertise with us today. It was fascinating, and I know that we will want to bring you back in the future for another episode and talk about this in more detail. Um, if you would like more information about the work that EFRI is doing with wind energy, please visit www.epri.com. And please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform, or you can also view subscribe to EFRI's YouTube channel to watch this, uh, watch this series uh, moving forward. Thank you again so much. And until next time, goodbye. If you like today's show, we invite you to subscribe to our podcast and feel free to share the podcast with your colleagues and friends. For more information about EPRI, please visit our website at www.epri.com. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter at EPRI News. Together, we are shaping the future of energy. 